Okay, so here I am back at the remote terminal. Um, let's get to the correct position in the book. So we've skipped, we've done all this now. Um, obviously we didn't do this chapter eight because we didn't shoot, but we did all this stuff here. And the last thing we did was IP routes. The next tool we've got to do is BZIP2. And over here, um, I actually don't need to piggyback onto the Pentium Pro 200 um, server anymore. I can go directly in to the um, CLFS machine. So I'm going to do that. And as you can see, it's not refused the connection. And I'm in. So because this is using a, a relatively new um, open SSH um, from 2014, 2015, even though it's 10 years old, it's still uh, got the capabilities to allow me to log in. So there you can see it just to confirm that I'm, in, I'm on the right machine. So into sources and did I tidy up? I was in BLFS, wasn't I? Yep. Okay, so let's carry on with BZIP2. This should be a little bit quicker now because it's obvious what to copy and what to paste. Uh, just generally a lot easier. So we'll start the build by putting in these set commands. And building a static library, is it the looks of it? No, sorry, a, a dynamic library. Okay, so that's BZIP done. GDBM next. That's done, so move on to Perl. By default, Perl's compressed raw, Z11 compressed raw, BZIP2 modules link, build and link against internal copies. The following commands will make use of, make Perl use the system install copies of these libraries. So let's do that. That sounds like a good thing to do. If you are following the boot method, you need to enable the loopback device. Okay, so if we look at the loopback device at the moment, it's actually down. But obviously for some part of Perl, it needs that link to be up. So we use that command to bring it up. And if we look at this status now, you can see that the loopback is actually unknown at the moment. Um... But you could see that it's different from how it was before. It was just those two lines. And now the status is all this information. You can see there's a loopback address. So clearly um, that's required. Uh, before we start to configure, create a basic ETC host file, which will be referenced by one of Perl's configuration files as well as used by the test suite. So um, obviously there's something to do with the loopback address, which is why we've had to activate it. So we'll create that temporary f uh, host file and start the configure.
Okay, run make. So I'm not going to be running tests. I did get the odd um, error with some of the packages, but there was nothing particularly to worry about, um, which is why I'm not testing this time for the sake of speed more than anything else. What I've seen so far is uh, I've been happy with, so. Right, so that's built. Let's now install and unset those two variables that were set. And that's Perl completed. So read line, we've got a patch, configure it. Pilot install it and then move some files around. And that's done. So auto conf next. Configure, build, and install. I'd say for these two packages, also conf and also make, they're quite unusual because they're among the quickest packages to build and yet probably among the longest to test. Auto conf, so auto make next. Configure, make, and install. Next we've got bash.
Okay, it's done. Let's install it and we'll execute a copy of it as well. So BC next. That's done. Diff utils. So there's one little fix here. Configure it. Another tiny little change before we build it. And install it. So on to file next. So straightforward build instructions. That's complete. Into Gork. All done. So that's find you tools done. Get text next. Let's build that.
Okay, it's done. Let's now install it. And complete. Move on to grep. That's done. Move on to Groff. So just need to set the paper size here. And for me, it's A4. That's done. Less next. Gzip. done. IP utils next. Patch compile package and install certain programs the looks of it. Keyboard next, KBD rather. That's done. Lib pipe one.
So move on to make next. Set utils. mod So again, make sure you extract the correct patch if you're doing this. The other patch is the patch to raise the version of the kernel. Misc. Lib E S T R. So it says Libby will fail to compile if using multiple jobs with make. So I did try this and it did seem to compile right, but I might have just been lucky. Um, looks like I've been lucky again. Arsis log. So we've got a configuration file to put in. And we move on to sysv in it.
it's an init tab. And we're not using a, a serial console. And we do want some virtual terminals, so we'll put that in. And we'll just tidy up the end of the script there, the configuration file rather. So tar next. Text info. You dev. Well, the correct only rules that the EU dev will name the Ethernet devices properly for the system. Okay. So Vim now. Okay, that's done.
Grub, right, as I said um, previously, I'm not going to build this um, basically because I've kept the earlier versions of Linux from scratch. I may be keeping all of these images and it would mean if I, well, I could build it, I guess, but if I ran the install, um, it would break the um, compatibility with those older ones because it, um, it would be 64-bit code that would be installed and the older machines wouldn't be able to boot that. The 32-bit machines wouldn't be able to boot that. So I'm not even going to build it actually in case um, I accidentally run it. Um, if I was ever on this image, it's unlikely that I would ever um, want to use these partitions again, but I'm just thinking like if I did, if this was a, a system that I'd be building and wanting to keep and so on. So I'll skip that and move on with the finishing up of this build. So stripping strip the binaries and so on it's log out um, now the thing is we're not in a true environment we've got programs running potentially such as bash so I'm not going to be able to strip unless I go into another environment and then true in so I'll skip this as well um, obviously if spaces is an issue this is something you might want to do we've still got 2.7 gig available so that's not a problem so we'll go on to system configuration and we need to extract the boot scripts and install them and the same to get the network running as well which we will be using So some information about how they work. Set clock, script. So I'm leaving that as UTC equals one because the time is set to UTC or GMT. Um, what's this about? Device and module handling. Um, I don't think there's anything that needs to be done here by default for a basic system. Um, yeah, stuff about symbolic links and so on here dealing with duplicate devices, so I don't normally touch that. Bash start, shell startup file, so there's a default ETC profile here. Locale information, so we need to set this up. So if you look at the locales that are installed in the system and find out what the default is for me, the char map that needs to set, just replace that part with the locale you want to use so I want to use this one here put that in and it responds with this so this is what I need to put in down here at this point here oh, sorry at this point here so if I copy this the language and the country well that's the first part of this followed by the full stop and then the char map is the output of the previous command and then just put in the remainder input RC file put that in and an etc fs tab so let's put that in and edit it it's probably the easiest way to deal with it so here we want to put in dev sda10 because that's the root partition of our new system our clfs system it's an ext3 file system uh, i want to keep the defaults i want to add in slash dev slash sda2 for the boot partition and that's an ext2 and I don't want that to be mounted automatically, but I do want to re keep the remaining defaults and swap 
is the STA3 partition and everything else there stays the same. Networking configuration. So part of the job of the local net script is set the system host name. So let's copy this and I'll call the host name um, maybe something like CLFS-300. So I need to remember that because I'll need it in the hosts file. So the network card version is this one here because I'm using networking. If you don't use networking, you'll just have to put in the uh, loopback IP address. So again, I'm going to edit this now. Now I've copied that template in there. And this needs to be changed to the local oops, IP address. So for this machine, it's going to be 52. And the host name is, if you remember, CLFS-300 at mynet.org. And repeat the host name here. And any other aliases, I might want to call the machine. And get rid of that bracket as well. So that looks good. etcresolve.conf. Let's put that in. And again, edit it. So the domain I've got here, if you haven't got domain, you can leave this blank or just leave out the line full stop. Mynet.org. IP address of the primary name server. I only use one normally. And that takes care of any more. Although arguably I should have another one in there in case I can't even reach that name server. But that normally does for me. DHCP or static networking. I always use static networking. So I'll just copy all this in. Oops, not there though. I'll save that first. And then edit that. So again, the IP address is the local address of this machine. The gateway I have to put in correctly and the broadcast address that should be sufficient. So because I've done static addressing, I don't need to do um, a DHCP C server. making the system bootable. So here's where we actually build our final kernel. So let's go back to sources. Extra, let's have a look at the Linux we've got. Yes, I've still got the old directory there. Okay. So I'm okay to extract the Linux 3.14 tarball. change into it and we patch it up to a newer version and then make MR proper to clean any files that may be there. If there aren't any because it didn't look like it's done anything. Then I'm going to do zcat again proc config.gz and output that to .config config oh no that's wrong I'll remove that. Yes. Uh, okay. Rm dot dot config. Ls dot config. Make sure that's still there. Yes, it is. Now I'm going to do make old config. Just to make sure there's been no changes or nothing's happened to that config file. It hasn't. Now I'm going to go into make menu config and this is the bit I said about 
that I hadn't set originally when I was testing this and it wouldn't boot, couldn't mount the file system and this is why um, really this should have been earlier on in the book um, when we're building the temporary um, kernel. So we'll just check it's still there, generic driver options, maintain a dev tempfs and the fallback it says we don't need so let's uncheck that. I'm also going to go into the emulations in theory because this is a pure LFS, 64-bit uh, LFS installation there's no need for the IA32 emulation, no 32-bit emulation so I'll remove that uh, if it doesn't work I'm gonna have to put it back in there but in theory it should work like that um, if I have error support for GUID partition of EUFI system, UEFI systems. So I am going to be getting to that point at some point. So I'm going to enable that, even though I don't need it at the moment. Um, it's something that's going to be needed soon. So I think it's under here, is it? Yeah, EFS file system support. Oh, that's file system support. I'll put that in anyway. Um, if I uh, it looks like I might need to set that as well. Miscellaneous file systems. So it could be that variables hasn't appeared because the EFI, was it under here, hasn't been set. Like I said, I don't need it at the moment, but I'm thinking ahead. If I go to a machine, is it this one here? Yep. It says it should continue to boot on non-EFI. Right, don't need that. So if I go back to the file systems, miscellaneous, no, it's not appeared. Oh yeah, there it is there at the bottom. Okay, yeah, if I decide to go to a machine, change the machine next that has got EFI boot and I decide to use it, then at least the kernel's configured to do that. I don't think I need to change anything else for now. Although having said that, I probably need to reinstall a new network driver. That's a, a high possibility. So that's okay. I'm going to build this now and come back in a few minutes.
Right, there you go, that's built after four and a bit minutes. So we haven't got any modules, but let's run this command anyway. And install some firmware. Not sure if that's absolutely needed, but never mind. So now we need to mount the boot directory because we're going to copy our boot files there. So let's mount boot. And this will work now because we've um, got an FS tab file with the appropriate information. There it is there. And we can see that's in there. So let's copy these files into the boot. Um, I'm actually going to rename these slightly. So the Linux kernels VM Linux CLF 3.14.21. I'm going to change this to match that. So we system dot map followed by that and move the config for 3.4 1421 to config dash CLFS just so it's more obvious as to which um, installation those files belong to. Um, okay, so let's pop D, go back to where we were, change the ownership of these files to the root if they're going to be kept. Okay, making the CLFS system bootable. Right, I'm definitely not going to run this. Because, well, I can't run it actually because I've uh, built Grub and therefore also I can't create the Grub config file. So I'll have to edit the um, existing Grub file, which is from the older Grub. So it's still menu.list. And what I'm going to do is to copy these four lines and instead of being a temporary system or the build system uh, it's actually now the live system so I'll just put in its x86 underscore 64 to remind me if I do decide to put this on a an older machine to remind me that it won't boot and I'll also remind myself that it's almost the equivalent of LFS 7.5 as well in the title. We've got return the root partition back to the boot partition. So this was the root of the current partition that CLFS is on because that's where the kernel was. Now it's not, it's back on the boot where it should be. And I just need to remove this path because the kernel that we want to boot is actually on the root of this partition, which is the boot partition, not the root partition. And that is the correct file name. Make sure that's right this time. And that's the correct partition as well. Correct file name and correct partition. So I'll save that. Um, I guess I could... Um, install wget and links while I'm here actually so I'll go into um, BLFS and let's see if I can get the BLFS book here as well um, duplicate tab Right, so the first one I want to install is wget 
and then links. There's very little point in reinstalling OpenSSL or OpenSSH. They obviously work. The only thing I might do is install the boot scripts just to demonstrate that they don't seem to work very well. So let's do wget tar xvf So I've got an open SSL, so it should work. Let's configure and build that all in one go. Okay, and install. Okay, and I'll test that. Um, yeah, let's go here. And see if we can download a file. Um, oh, that'll be small enough copy link address so this will be an HTTPS I'm still not sure if this will work or not it might do Oops. that work is unreachable okay I'm not sure why that's Stating that uh, maybe that the network network hasn't actually been installed correctly, not enough to get out. Whereas I've in, I've installed or configured enough to get the SSHD working. Um, okay, so I'll test that after I've rebooted. Um, so I'll install links now. Um, so I think there's a few extra options I can put onto this that do actually work now that didn't work previously. So this enable NLS worked and it was this with SSL I think didn't work in previous versions for some reason. But it should work now. Okay, and build it. Okay, I'll install that and then just configure it with these options here. And let's see if we can use links to get to, for example, this web page that I'm actually on. Yeah, that seems to work fine. In fact, it's quite nice because the highlighting is making it a little bit more obvious what, what does what, although the commands are still unfortunately not highlighted. It's a bit of a shame. Okay, what I'm going to do now is the system is more or less complete. I'm going to reboot while I'm still here and just hopefully show that I can still get in 
and the new kernel's working. And then what I'll do is I'll put the um, video back onto the actual terminal so you can see it booting up um, in all its glory. And also there's probably going to be a few little error messages and things that happen on the boot. And I'll finally install the SSHD script um, uh, just in case that does work. Although um, I, I can't think that I did anything wrong that made it not work before so I'd expect it to not work now um, so let's tidy that up Links to dash have I got the boot scripts yeah let's just extract that ready so those boot scripts are ready for me to install the SSHD um, startup scripts so yeah I'll uh, log off of this and reboot on the terminal okay so it's just got the um, boot screen <coughs> coming up yeah, so the new um, grub entry has appeared. I press enter and I've actually forgotten to leave in the forward slash on the file name. I can see straight away. So I need to fix that. And press B to boot. Yeah, now it's booting. Yeah, and I've got, and this is what I had when I. Um, did this before I've got an error a failure on rsys log d so for some reason the system logger is not running um, not a great deal of a problem but if I um, ssh back into e7500 um, right I need to run that script again to get the sshd running in fact I won't run it because that's got the part of it to start the networking and in theory, that should be running, uh, which it is by the looks of it. So I'll uh, edit that. Boot up script to not start the network. I'll just comment those lines out. And boot up sh is running or has run so if I now type ssh uh, I'll have to do root at e7500 should be able to get in yeah that's good so first thing I'll do before I forget is to update the menu.list because I erroneously omitted that forward slash there because it is off the root of the current partition otherwise it doesn't know where to look for it so that should fix the boot next time um, IPA yeah as you can see the networking's come up this is a bit weird well, I don't know why that's unknown um, but let's try the wget command again see if that works yes it's working this time now um, so the certificate, that's probably because there's no certificates installed on the machine, which is why this is failing. So I'd need to go through um, Beyond Linux from Scratch to install some certificates. So if I put that in, that should actually work. And yes, it has. So um, if I use Vi, it should hopefully highlight it with some colour being it's a XML file and yes it has so you can see that's that's worked okay now so that's good uh, I'll just delete that so that's that so as you can see it is all working correctly um, there's the as you can see the new kernel with the new host name um, it's the only copy, whereas the previous one I'd, I had to build twice because I'd omitted, uh, what is that, Dem dev temp fs I'd omitted. So that's why that was the second version of the build. Um, 
there's the CPU info again. You can see it's the two core E7500. And that's all complete with still just about two gigabytes left. Bearing in mind, still got that old version of the Linux kernel, um, which could be deleted for probably about a gigabyte recovery of space. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to shut this down now and start it up again with the recorder on, on the terminal just so you can see the actual boot itself. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll install those boot scripts for SSHD um, and see what happens with that. So I'll just shut this down now and come back on the terminal.